I'd like for you to turn in your Bibles, first of all, we got, we got uh, uh, three different passages of Scripture we're going to look at this morning. First of all, the Gospel of John. Turn to chapter number 16, if you would, please. Gospel of John, chapter 16. Amen. Let me just read. If I get ahead of you, we're just going to read reading short passages of Scripture, and um, uh, we we want to move quickly into the Word this morning. the The Gospel of John, chapter sixteen, says in verse number twenty four, Jesus speaking to his disciples says, "Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive, that your joy may be full." This is a new concept of some Christian's mind who thinks that uh, uh, somehow they are serving out penitence the rest of their life after their salvation. Jesus says to his disciples that if they will ask, they will then receive for the purpose that he might put joy in their life, that their joy might be full. Then a very familiar passage of Scripture, chapter number 4 of the epistle of James. James chapter 4, this passage of Scripture, I know that many of you have quoted this, and so I want to read it to you again today. James says, Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. The scripture we often quote from the King James, that passage of scripture, you have not because you ask not. And verse 3 then says, you ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. Father, I pray right now in the name of Jesus that you would give us a clarity of thought Help us to hear clearly what the Spirit is saying to the church today. Now, Lord God, we want to have our eyes of our understanding open. And we want to have not only ears to hear, but a heart to perceive what the Spirit is speaking to the church today. Have your way in our heart today and let your name be glorified in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to read another passage of Scripture to you in just a few uh, moments. Actually, we have two other uh, texts that we are going to be referring to. But um, in, uh, back, back to the Gospel of John, passage of Scripture that has left Christian believers struggling to have enough faith to take hold of throughout the history of the church is from the 14th chapter of the Gospel of John. In in, uh, verse number 12, Jesus says, Most assuredly, I say to you, He who believes in me, the works that I do, will he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go to my Father. That absolutely blows our mind. Our brain almost hits a short circuit when we try to take hold of that scripture by faith, that we would do the things that Jesus did. That alone is enough to stretch our ability to even imagine that. Then he says, and you will do greater works than the works that I do because I go to my Father. Well, you say, I I cannot hardly believe that. I'm going to have to find another way to interpret it so I can believe it don't do that you just see the bible is really not a hard book to understand most of the time most of the time it's pretty clear god has the ability to say what he means and mean what he says our problem gets comes when we read something that we can't hardly believe so when we change it to try to make it something easier to believe that's when it becomes hard to understand he plainly says it, it, he that believes on me, the works that I do, he will do. And greater works than these shall you do because I go to my Father. So we need to get our mind, we, get, we need to insist that our mind line up 
with the Word of God. Don't believe it because you understand it. Believe it because he says it. And so the very next verse then. And whatever you ask in my name, I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, he says, I will do it. Now, we've been talking this during this month about the solution. How many needs a solution? I mean, we, we can use a solution. I, I, I feel uh, sometimes when I'm trying to stretch my budget, anybody ever, ever have too much month at the end of your money? I... When I'm trying to stretch my budget, I kind of feel condemned. Did you ever feel condemned? Because you thought, man, I should have planned better. I shouldn't be sitting there trying to make my money stretch. It ought to fit. Then I look at the federal government. $13 trillion. I don't even know what that means. So when they say that we win another one and a half trillion in debt this year, why do I care? 14 trillion, 13 trillion, what's the difference? Yeah. It, but um, I, I'm telling you, we need a solution. And the solution, you, you, you can say it any way, on your, uh, any way you want to. Accountants will tell you the way to make your budget match is you got two ways to work on your budget to make it fit. You can either get more income or you can get less expenditures, or a little of both. But you can't keep spending more to make it fit. huh? That will not make the budget work. If you, did, anyone, uh, did anyone ever hear the expression that you were borrowing from Paul to pay Peter? Or to rob Peter? I don't want to rob anybody, but uh, borrowing and... Uh, so we need, a, we need a solution. God has a solution. Now listen, I'm going to tell you this. God has a solution. The solution is God wants to bless his people and let his people bless the rest of the country. That's the plan. Don't sit around and wait for the Republicans to figure it out because they won't do it. Don't wait for the Democrats to figure it out. They don't have a plan. God's got the plan. God wants to bless his people, and his people is going to bring this country out of debt. Wouldn't you like to be the guy? Wouldn't you like to be the guy that wrote the tax check that brought this country out of a $13 trillion debt? You wouldn't. Yeah, I want you to know you would. Do you know how much you'd have left? You ain't got a hold of this. Let me move on. I... I'm trying to tell you, you know, some people always try and figure out, you know, how am I going to keep from paying taxes? Quit making any money. <laughs> God's got a solution. This is the solution. First of all, God, ta God taught us to ask. Prosperity, God's blessing of prosperity is the same as anything else. It comes from the Lord. He wants us to ask him and believe him. Uh, folks would try to get their own way to wealth, work their own, try to use their own ingenuity, try to leave God out of it. That, that will not prosper. Go ahead and ask God. You have not because you ask not. Why do people reluctant to ask God? It's just a pride thing. They want to do it on their own. Let me tell you, don't do that. Make God your partner. Ask God. Ask and you will receive. Seek and you'll find. Knock and it will be open unto you. I want to challenge you with this today. Do not hesitate to write out. We were talking last week about having the plan. Do not hesitate to write out the plan and say, Lord, this is it. This is what I want you to bless. Here is my income. Here is my expenses. I want you to bless this plan. I want your hand to be on this plan and exercise faith. You've prayed, you've asked, believe that God hears you and brings that plan 
to success. Ask that you can and you, and you will receive. Now, Jesus makes us this promise and we find it a little bit overwhelming. fact is, even when I'm saying this to you, you know you're thinking in your heart, whoa, I hope this will work. I want it to work. I want God to bless me. I want to pray a prayer that God will answer and, and will, will provide a solution for me. Folks, you want to believe, but there's this thing that says, ah, sounds too easy. Sounds like another one of those get quick, rich quick thing. I didn't say anything like that. You know, the Bible tells us that he that gathers money little by little is wise. This is not a fast thing. This is a lifelong partnership with the Holy Ghost that turns your situation into one of prosperity. But when we ask Jesus, he makes us this promise. He says, you ask the Father in my name, and he says, I will do it. That is the words of Jesus. You ask the Father, he said, in my name, and I will bring it to pass. And, and always the enemy is trying to cloud God's blessing into your life. So he comes and says, why should God bless you? Why would God want to put blessing into your life? Now, we could talk about a lot of different things, but I'm going to make this very simplistic today. We read it as a text. Jesus said, up till now, you have not asked anything in my name. But now, he said, I'm telling you, ask in my name. Ask, and you will receive that your joy be made full. He just wants to bless you. And so we want to give him the opportunity to do that. All right. I want you to turn with me to the book of First Chronicles, the Old Testament passage of Scripture. First Chronicles, chapter number 4. If you do not, if you, now I'm assuming that most of you folks make notations in your Bible. And um, I would, if you do make notations in your Bible and you do not have this verse of Scripture marked, I want to just encourage you to mark this. The reason that I think everybody ought to mark this is because it's a real hard passage of Scripture to find from memory. Why? Why? Uh, from the time I was very young, I would always run into these discipleship programs that would tell you you need to read the entire Bible through. Different ways of doing it. You know, read it through a few verses, a few chapters a day for a year, and you read through whatever. And I always get to certain parts of the Bible, and it's really tedious. Like the, the, the genealogies, name after name, generation after generation. I can't pronounce any of them. Go, I mean, I'll go, I'll read uh, the history for a thousand years and I can't pronounce one name in the whole list. And um, so it's, you know, it's really hard to read that. And so the passage of scripture we're going to look at here today comes right in the middle of the genealogies. First Chronicles starts out just given who begat who, who was whose father, who had how many children, and on and on and on it goes. And it's really tough. I mean, you're trying to pay attention, but really, how do you pay attention to one name after another? And how does some of these names get so many consonants in them? I want you to know. And so, if you're reading along in the book of First Chronicles, you, it doesn't go the whole book that way, but it goes for the first, I believe, six uh, chapters that is just genealogies. And so I get in the fourth chapter. I got to read it through. Got to read every name. Got to read every word. And I don't know how many times I must have read across this. And it just did not register because I was, I was just in that mode of reading who it was, bet, beget, who it became, what it was. It, it just really. But I came across this scripture one day and like a light went on because it was a diversion from one generation to the next. Right in the middle of this uh, genealogy, they introduce us to a man by the name of Jabez. How many ever heard of Jabez before? 
Everybody, I tell you what, everybody may have, uh, have the handle on this. Do you know what the name means? Pain. I want you to know my mom named me Wright. Do you know what David means? Beloved. I name my kids Wright. You know what Danette means? The judgment of God. You think I'm kidding. If you know Danette, you know I named her Wright. And, um, but Jabez's mother named him Pain. Folks, let me just make a recommendation for you. When you have your next child and you want to christen them, think of something besides pain. You know, pain in the neck, pain in whatever. Just get a different name than pain. And, and so the Bible says about Jabez, verse number 9. Now, Jabez was more honorable than his brothers, and his mother called his name Jabez, saying, because I bore him in pain. He is a pain. He might be more honorable than his brothers, but he's a pain, and I and gave him that name. That's a terrible thing. Well, Jabez could have done what a lot of people would have done if you get put behind the eight ball. Some people just wait for the eight ball to roll over them, but not Jabez. Jabez said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray my way out of this. I was born to pain. My mom, my own mom, called me a pain. But I don't want to stay like this. So he begins to pray this prayer. He called on the God of Israel saying, Oh, that you would bless me indeed and enlarge my territory, that your hand would be with me and that you would keep me from evil that I may not cause pain. I don't want to be a pain anymore. And God granted him what he requested. Now, what I want you to do when you got more time, because I know you're going to pay rigid attention to me for the next 10 minutes till I finish this message. You won't want to do it now, but perhaps you'd like to do this when you get home tonight or this afternoon. Just open up your Bible and try to find what happened to Jabez. You will not find that name again. You didn't find that name before this passage of Scripture. And now we're talking about his children, but we don't find his name again. What I'm telling you is God so thoroughly changed the life and the situation. The Bible says that he granted Jabez his petition. He so thoroughly changed him that his name was changed. You do not find Jabez ever mentioned again because this man was never a pain again. God granted him his petition. Now, I think that a mistake that some people may get when they read this passage, I read through this thing, 90 to nothing trying to get through this genealogy. I don't know how many times before I ever realized that this wonderful prayer and this wonderful story was ever mentioned in the fourth chapter of 1 Chronicles. When I finally realized what had happened, I read this passage of Scripture and thought, well, isn't this great? I'm going to pray that prayer. The first time I recognized that that was a prayer, I said, I'm going to pray that prayer. And so I prayed it. I prayed, oh, God, that you would bless me indeed and enlarge my coast. I pray that your hand would be with me, that it would keep me from evil, that I would not cause pain. Prayed that prayer and waited for my world to change. But I'm going to tell you, if there was any changes that came from praying that prayer that first time, it was very subtle, very subtle. Maybe there was some kind of response that should have been noted, but i got to tell you that as far as me being able to say that was a life-changing day, the day... I prayed that prayer. I, I cannot say that. Then I thought this. Now, wait. Did, did this passage indicate that Jabez prayed this prayer one time and then uh, his life changed and never prayed again? I believe this became the prayer 
of Jabez, his life. I, be, I believe he prayed it in the morning when he woke up. And perhaps he prayed it again when he lay down for the night. I think that maybe he prayed this prayer several times in the course of the day. It only takes 30 seconds to pray this prayer. He changed his life by praying this prayer continually and God began to change Jabez's prayer. Jabez changed the way he talked. He changed the way he prayed. And God began to change his life. I want to suggest to you today that we do not have because we do not ask. The Bible challenges us to ask and then we shall receive. We need to ask so that we can receive. The Bible tells us we have not because we ask not. We need to ask so that we may receive. And I want to tell you that this is God's solution, that we would form a partnership with God that would not last for a day or two or not last until we feel like we've got an answer to our prayer to, that God's prospered us. Instead, we need to form this partnership with God that will carry on the rest of our life, that we're never going to come to a place of saying, all right, God, thank you for the help. I got it from here. But instead, we're going to form a partnership with God that he's going to be our provider. He's going to be our director. He's going to be leading our life from this day forward the rest of our life, a lifelong partnership with God. And I want you to listen to this prayer that Jabez prayed, and I want to challenge you to pray. You can read these words and make that a prayer, but I want to challenge you to make this the prayer and the cry of your heart from this day forward the rest of your life. And not just rambling these words, but take into, into consideration what was Jabez saying when he called out from the depth of his heart in this way. Here, here is a man whose life has been affected, impacted by negative things that his mother had put into his life from his birth. But he begins to pray this prayer. First of all, he says, God, would you please bless me? Well, we kind of feel bad about the idea, asking God to bless us. You know, if we were a little bit more... Uh, Generous, we think about the other person before us, not Jabez. Jabez says, God, I have absolutely nothing to put into this generation that I live in. I can make nothing. I can make no contribution to this generation. I cannot help people. I cannot cause folks that are downfalling to stand up on their feet. There is no investment I can make because I have nothing to give. I have no talent. I have no uh, ability. I have no resources. I want to do something that's good and positive, but I cannot make a contribution until you put something in my life. So he says, God, would you bless me? Would you let me be a participant in your plan? Would you put me in the flow of what you're doing in this generation? God, I want you to bless me. In fact... Next part, he said, would you bless me indeed? To put that in our vernacular, he's saying, God, I want you to bless me a lot. I don't want you to bless me enough to be able to pay the cable bill this month. I want you to bless me. I want not only my needs to be met, but I want there to be a surplus. You know, he was talking about the move of God when John Hall said to me many years ago, he said, they were warning me. He'd gone off to a revival down in Florida to uh, 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 Brown. Uh, who? No, 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 Brown, Brown. Uh, uh, no, Doc, what? Rodney Howard Brown. He'd gone down to Rodney Howard Brown's uh, place down there and got into revival state before we came back and they said, Oh, John, you've gone off the deep end. He said, good, that's the end I've been looking for. I've been playing around in the shallow end too long. I want to get it. They said, well, it's kind of excessive. He said, good. He said, I've been too long when there's been not enough. I want to be when there's an abundance. 
And that's what I'm telling you today about the way we're asking God to put blessing in our life. We're not asking him to bless us just to keep us putting along. We want him to bless us a lot. That you would bless me, bless me indeed. And then when he says enlarge my borders, he's saying increase my influence. You know, they used to tell us that everybody in, impacted about 11 lives. That was some kind of estimate. I don't know how they figured that out. And, um, and there may be some kind of uh, way to validate that estimation that 11 people we influence mightily. But Jabez says, you know what? I'm not satisfied with influencing the people that I influence, being a blessing to us four and no more. He said, God, I want you to enlarge my influence. My circle, uh, my sphere of influence. I want to, I want you to enlarge my boundaries. I want you to make my life bigger. I want to have more going on in my life than, than just waking up in the morning and waiting for the sun to go down in the evening. I want to be a role player in what is going on. So, Lord, bless me. Bless me a lot and enlarge my influence. And then he says, Lord, I want your hand to be with me. You know, the hand of the Lord with us means two separate things, both important, and we, and we desire them with our whole heart. First of all, if the hand of the Lord is with us, it means that he is leading us. We can kind of hear the voice of the shepherd, David, in the uh, shepherd's psalm when he said, Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. I want your hand to be with me. When I go through dark places, I want to have the hand of someone that knows where I'm going to be guiding me, to have your hand in my life. So I'm asking that your hand would be with me. The second thing that the hand of the Lord being in our life refers to is his mighty and powerful anointing. I not only want you to lead my life, I want you to empower my life. I want people to just heave a sigh of relief when I walk in the room because we know that the hand of the Lord's with that man. If he's here, things are going to get better. God is with that man. What a wonderful testimony for us to say. People say, there, the hand of God is upon him. The hand of God is is upon him. I had an interesting thing take place. Everybody, uh, the, the uh, children that Linda often picks up and brings to youth or to Sunday school, they don't want me to drive them home because they don't trust my driving. They, they say, now Linda's a good driver, Sister Dylan's a good driver, Brother Dylan, he's a bad driver. I don't know where they got that idea. But uh, I, I, um, I had an occasion to be driving a school bus at the plant and um, I thought I was watching everything real close but there was um, a chain link fence that came outside the door of the building and when I turned to the uh, right, I didn't swing out enough to make room for the back end and somehow the tire the right, right rear tire just ran over that, uh, it was a T-post that was holding up that chain link fence and just knocked it over like that. I heard it fall. I, I, I didn't feel it, but I heard it fall. And I thought, what in the world have I done? So I stopped the bus and I got out to look to see. And sure enough, I knocked that fence over. And so there was nothing I could do but just take my punishment. I was thinking, Lands, I'm looking at three days off. I, this is going to be bad. Pretty soon, my team leader came out to check out what had happened, saw that chain link fence knocked down, and we looked over that bus. We looked over the outside, the underneath, the undercarriage. We checked everything on the fender around that wheel, and you could not find a single mark on that bus. And my team leader said, 
I have been trying to get them to move that fence for three weeks. And Dylan has moved it. And there's not a mark on the bus anywhere. He said, that's exactly what you'd expect to happen if that preacher ever got in a wreck. I'm talking about what it's like to have the hand of the Lord with you. That your hand would be with me. And then the last line of the prayer said, keep me from evil that I don't cause pain. There's two things that mean that is referred to when he says, keep me from evil. First of all, the same thing as when Jesus said, lead me not into temptation. I don't want to be subject to the, to the devil's temptation. Keep me from evil. Keep me from temptation. But the other thing is, don't let anything bad happen to me. And when, when the devil meant it for, good, for bad, God turns it for our good. What a powerful prayer to be praying. Don't let me cause pain. His, pain, his name meant pain. Every time someone saw him, he'd say, they'd say, well, there comes pain. But he said, I don't want people to associate me with pain anymore. Keep me from evil that I will not cause pain. In fact, his prayer was, make me a blessing. And from the time God began to put blessing and answer the prayer of Jabez, his entire life changed. Instead of people looking at him and say, well, there comes pain, they began to say, there comes blessing. I want you to know when they see you coming, they ought to say, bam, there comes blessing. You know, there, I know how that some people are. They've got an anointing. It's called the cloud anointing. When they show up in the room, everybody says, well, here's going to rain. May not rain outside where we need it, but it's going to rain right in here. Is this a storm cloud? We had, we had a, a, there's a, there's a fine pastor that Linda and I used to hold revivals for. Every, every year or two, we'd go hold a revival for them. And we, lo- we love these people, love their church. But when you met his wife, every time you just wondered what the battle was this week, you know. It's, it, I won't tell you, we do go through things, and we've got to handle those things, but here should be our testimony. Our testimony should be that God makes us conqueror and turns our situation around. Amen. Make me a blessing. Do not let me be a pain. I'd like for you to stand with me, please, everyone today. I want you to know that it's God's plan to bless you. The whole plan of God is about blessing you. Those that receive the gift of God which is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord to discover that when Jesus came to give us abundant life that did not mean just for after we die abundant life begins now and God wants to put his abundance on you and so um, I want I'm going to lead you in this prayer I, I suppose that we could read it from our Bibles but everybody's got a different translation And so we wouldn't say it just alike. So I'm going to lead you in this prayer, and this will be the paraphrased edition. And I want want to encourage you that you pray this prayer. Look it up in your Bible. You pray this prayer every day until it's in your heart, until you can just from memory, from out of your heart, just say to the Lord, I want to pray the prayer of Jabez. I want your hand of blessing upon my life. I want, you, I want to challenge you to do it. And In fact, I've, I've heard of some people testify that they pray this prayer. Some of them have prayed it every day for years. And um, I believe that God's will to bless you is manifested in this prayer. So pray this prayer with me. I'm going to lead you and I want you to pray this prayer with me. Heavenly Father... 
I want you to bless me. Indeed. A lot. And enlarge my borders. I want your hand to be with me. And keep me from evil. That I may not cause pain. For Jesus' sake, amen. Now let the Lord make you a blessing. I said, I want the Lord to make you a blessing. 